Hi, this is Matt Skinner with a special announcement. Our fall campaign is officially underway and off to a great start. This week, we are celebrating Working Preacher as a community of interpretation. No single tradition or person has exclusive insight into the Word of God. That's why we gather together a collection of faithful interpreters who bring a broad range of voices and perspectives. Your gifts help us keep this community of interpretation wide, inviting, outward facing, insightful, and sometimes challenging, but always focused on what emerges when we dive into the scriptures together. Join me in giving thanks for the interpreters we learn from at Working Preacher. Go to workingpreacher.org today to make your gift securely online. Thank you. Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. Hey, this is the podcast on Hosea, the book of Hosea, and it's for November 12th, 2023. Um, last week, we were uh, with Elijah uh, and the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel. And the book of Hosea stays in the Northern Kingdom. It's from about a century or not quite a century, but it's from later, uh, at least a couple generations later. So we're still in, in the uh, Northern uh, Kingdom of Israel. And the thing about Hosea is he, it's a controversial book, but we, this is not the controversial part. However, the controversial part is important that uh, the first couple chapters of the book, first three chapters, uh, takes up uh, the marriage and family metaphor, where um, especially the marriage is the controversial part. But the, the familial part is also important that Hosea uh, names his children uh, symbolic prophetic names. They are um, Jezreel, uh, after a place where an atrocity was committed by uh, one of the northern kings, and then not pitied and not my people are the names of his second and third child. And then later on, Hosea um, reverses their names, so they become um, pitied and my people. And you can see that extension here in chapter 11, where God is the parent and, and Israel is the beloved child. When Israel was a child, I loved him. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Yeah, when I when I teach uh, passages like this, or talk about these metaphors, you're right, Rolf, that the particularly the marriage metaphor uh, can be fraught sometimes, and sometimes the prophets uh, take it too far, especially for modern sensibilities. Uh, in terms, and you know, you can talk about even um, uh, domestic abuse. You know, some of the metaphors go. Uh, at least get too close to that boundary. Uh, but what I tell my students is, uh, first of all, it's a cross-cultural experience whenever you're reading scripture. But also, these metaphors still have power, right? For most of us, the closest relationship, uh, or at least some of the closest relationships you're going to have in your life, uh, or you have had in your life, are with your parents, right, on the one hand. And then for uh I think fewer people today than in Hosea's time, but certainly for still a, a lot of people, uh, the marriage metaphor, right? Your spouse uh, is going to be that really close relationship in your adult life. Uh, and, and, and the reason that the prophets use these metaphors, and not just the prophets, it's also in the Pentateuch, uh, is because these are the relationships that have the most potential for joy and the most potential for pain, right? Because... We suffer when they don't work, uh, or when there's when there's conflict in those relationships, or obviously when uh, when they end, uh, uh, when when your beloved one dies, either your parent or your child, of course, or uh, or your uh, your spouse. So uh, so even though you know the, they can, these metaphors can be problematic, especially for modern folks. Uh, they still have a great deal of power, uh, and particularly in this passage, I think, where you know Israel is the son or the child, uh, and uh, and God is the is the parent. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Uh, you know, but they kept sacrificing to the Baals. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I was to them like those who lift infants to their cheeks. I bent down to them and fed them. Uh, 
right? That's it, that's just such a beautiful image, right? God as the as the loving parent uh, who teaches uh, their child to work, his child to walk, uh, and lifts them up to his cheek. So they, there's they, there's still power in those metaphors. I would say there's a, a familiarity that I I find too that still when I ask people in uh, preparation for marriage, what is worse? So when you get married, you take the vow for better and for worse. When I ask what's worse, um, what people always say is infidelity. It's being cheated on. I don't care what their premarital relationships have been like. Um, The idea of someone breaking that particular covenant and so even in today's time, uh, this uh, idea of um, in poetry to express the depth of pain, the depth of desire, um, the faithfulness of God, the repetitive failure of humanity, and yet God's capacity to forgive and offer another chance. And so that those opening uh, chapters is basically um, this prophet uh, in the name of God demonstrating what it is God is doing with Israel, his people, and ultimately, as we read it now, with all the world. And it's both God's continued faithfulness, but it's also an invitation that God believes that humanity can embody that kind of faithfulness in the flesh. And so by asking a prophet to do it, and then uh, as we read it now, as followers of the Christ, um, we saw in Jesus this faithfulness lived out. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we too have that capacity. The um, I think that's really helpful. And I think it's also true that the estrangement of parent and child when a parent rejects a child or a child rejects a parent. And right now in my life, I'm aware of situations where both of those are happening. Um, uh, without naming names, I know people who uh, whose parents won't have anything to do with them. And I also know of children who have abandoned parents. And um, to be rejected, I, I can't relate to that. My parents, um, uh, I've always been close to, and I never I had the feeling like uh, 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 um, of anything. I've never had any worse emotion than disappointment. You know what I mean? And of course, that that was uh, that stung pretty hard when I disappointed my parents. So, but but I think what Hosea then is doing is is calling up, uh, especially for the parent uh, in the, in this. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to translate. It, it, well, first of all, because this is Northern Hebrew, mm-hmm. and we have very little of it, so it the the it's just different than Southern Biblical Hebrew. And also, the text is probably fairly seriously corrupt by the hand copying uh, um, pr- process over the years. But this it's so it's so tender. I was to like I was like those who lift infants to their cheeks, uh, you know, that, that incredibly intimate, uh, feeling. And so in verse nine, it leads up to, I will not execute my fierce anger, anger. I will not again, destroy Ephraim for I am God and no mortal, uh, meaning that God is a parent who, um, will not ever fully reject, uh, God's children. Yeah, that's that's such a beautiful part, right? How can I give you up, O Ephraim? Ephraim, of course, being another name for the northern kingdom. How can I hand you over, O Israel? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I, that uh, I, I was as I was reading this before we started recording, I was thinking about our dearly departed colleague Terry Fredheim, uh, who taught Old Testament here at Luther Seminary for decades. 40 years, something like that. And uh, he, he, his probably most famous book uh, is called The Suffering of God. And he, and he talks about the suffering of God. And he talks about God suffers because uh, 
God suffers with and God suffers for. So that because I think is particularly pertinent here. God suffers because of broken relationships primarily, right? That that Israel, as you were talking about, Joy, right? Israel has uh, has has not kept the covenant faithfulness, or as you were saying, Ralph, right? Israel is like a child who has rejected his or her parent. Uh, so so God suffers because of that broken relationship. Uh, and and some of that is you know some of that suffering leads to uh, to anger. Uh, so you know in verse five, God says they shall return to the land of Egypt, and Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword rages in their cities; uh, it consumes their oracle priests. Right, but so so that suffering leads to uh, to judgment. But then uh, finally to mercy. But how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? I will not execute my fierce anger, for I am God and no mortal, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. So it's that uh, that God's mercy, God's love uh, for Israel, overcoming God's justifiable anger at their uh, at their unfaithfulness. Uh, so yeah, um, God suffers because God su- ultimately suffers for right God's suffering is redemptive. Uh, I remember a, a former colleague of ours in New Testament who said she didn't particularly like the prophets because they always sound peeved or God, or God always sounds peeved in the prophets. And it's like, yeah, and you can understand why, right? Uh, in, in this instance. I believe, I, I believe in preaching that we have to, um, uh, we're challenged to recognize that reality of, 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 I get that. I, I I would be angry. I I would be peeved. I would be frustrated, but not to stop there. I mean, there are a lot of people who have taken that as a reason to say they can't trust God. Um, and I, I'm I think as preachers, we need to challenge our listeners to say, if you can understand this disappointment, as you described, uh, Ralph, if you can understand um, this love, uh, as you translated the text, um, then I think we can understand the anger. So would we be willing to embody the gesture of grace? Because I, I think that's what these these books are here for. It's it's to tell us that in human failure, um, God still believes in humanity's capacity to bear the image of God in the flesh, and to keep our end of the covenant. And how is it that we could preach in such a way that rather than repeating the failures of uh, ancient Israel, to rather than saying because um, that's what people did. Of course, I'm going to do it. But rather to say, God's continued expression of faithfulness to them is extended to us. And maybe we could be that community that demonstrates the embodiment of the good of God's character.